This is the main principle. All these events must be in self-consistency with each other. It's so simple, so obvious, but more of that, we gave the strict mathematical proof that this principle is the consequence of the basic ideas of the physics. By the same token, any attempt a time traveller might make to rewrite history would be thwarted. Yes? I'm here to prepare your room, now. What has happened, has happened. It cannot be changed. It cannot be repeated twice in different ways. Human beings aren't billiard balls, and we might like to believe in free will. So a sufficiently stubborn human would seem to be able to get around any sort of consistency condition by just demanding that he does something different. I can have the free will to walk along this wall without special equipment. It's my free will. Can I do that? No, I can't. Why? Because of a law of physics, because of the law of gravity. It's forbidden. Gravity means you can't walk up a wall. So gravity already restrains our free will. And if time travel ever does become possible, other laws of physics would stop a traveller from changing the past. Andresco, open up, please. Immediately. Immediately now, at this job. Will you open up the door? Immediately. Those determined to change history might try to send a message backwards in time. But to do that, we'd have to send information faster than light. And this man reckons he can send a signal faster than light into the realm where Einstein said time would run backwards. This signal is split into, by an electronic mirror here, into two parts. So we can compare the signal one is moving through the air, and the other one is moving through the barrier. Yes. Gunter Nimtz splits a microwave signal. The half that goes through the air travels at the speed of light and is displayed on an oscilloscope. The half that hits the barrier should go nowhere, but that's not what seems to happen. This is an oscilloscope where you see the signal, and then we can see which one is faster. The two humps on the screen are not in the same place, because one signal got there faster than the other, and the faster one tunneled through the barrier. Only a very small part comes to the other side, but it comes, and this part comes at a velocity which is much faster than the velocity of light. Nimtz believes that the faster signal uses a strange effect called quantum tunneling to get past the barrier. Tunneling depends on the fact that down at the quantum level, where particles are a lot smaller than atoms, the world is a totally random place. When a particle like a photon is here, it also has a small but very real chance of being here, or here, or here, at the other end of the barrier. What Nimtz and his team did was to pick up the photons that appeared at the far end, and then to measure how fast they got there. <laughs> And I'm used about this. We did this for fun. And then we figured out that it's faster than the velocity of light. We did not think about its importance. The leader in this field, Raymond Chow, has misgivings about Nimtz's interpretations, but even he agrees with part of what Nimtz is saying. In our experiments, we have uh, measured uh, that a single photon can tunnel across a tunnel barrier at 1.7 times the speed of light. Right or wrong, this leads to an interesting thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment in German. 
What if you could tunnel a message to the other side of the universe? Going faster than light, the message would seem to go backwards in time. I came across a nice Gedanken experiment. There's a signal going to a far star, which is information that you were born. And 20 years later, tunnel the signal at your age of 20 years, and this will arrive before the signal comes to the star that you were born. Yes, if we had a tunnel barrier that was, uh, say, uh, very wide from here to the next galaxy, then in principle, yes, you could then, uh, in the tunnel effect, advance the wave uh, so much so that uh, it, it, uh, it begins to worry me that uh, we have sent something really fast in the speed of light. I consist, no, no, I not consist, I insist on it that we have and we can transmit signals faster than velocity of light. Perhaps one day our infinitely advanced grandchildren will send messages back through time, or even use wormholes to travel back comfortably themselves. But that leaves one big question. Time travel might be possible, but if that is the case, why haven't we been overrun by tourists from the future? This argument I find very dubious. It might be that time travel into the past is possible, but they haven't gotten to our time yet. They're very far in the future, and it's the further back in time you go, the more expensive it is. Then there's a possibility that they're here, all right, but we don't see them. They have perfect invisibility cloaks or something. If, if they're so smart, if they have such highly developed technology, then why not? Then there's the possibility that they're here, and we do see them but we call them something else, UFOs or uh, ghosts or... I think that if people from the future were going to show themselves, they would do so in a more obvious way. What would be the point of revealing themselves only to cranks and weirdos who wouldn't be believed? But physics does put a limit on how far back any time tourist could ever travel. Relativity theory says in general that uh, once you've made a time machine, you can never use it to go backward in time before the uh, period when it was made. Whatever else is allowed, relativity is firm on this. We can't go back because no one has yet built a time machine. I don't have to worry about the possibility of my going back and killing my father before I was conceived. Uh, what I have to worry about is my grandson coming, uh, going back in time and killing me uh, before uh, he is conceived. That is, uh, there's no possibility of changing our past, but uh, in the future, one can change uh, the future's past. This is not an inconsistency. This is just a strange thing that would happen if time travel were possible and the classical laws of physics were true. But the whole thing's rather academic because, in fact, the classical laws of physics aren't true and quantum mechanics is a true description of nature. David Deutsch is convinced that time travel is possible, but he explains the lack of time travelers by turning to that random, messy world of quantum mechanics. At bottom, the universe is riddled with quantum uncertainty. We're all made of quantum particles with uncertain positions and uncertain behaviors. But Deutsch's version of reality requires uncertainty on a much larger scale. Quantum mechanics is a theory of many parallel universes. Some of them are alike, and some of them are very unlike. There are nearby universes that differ from this one only in the position of one photon or one electron. There are other more distant universes where we're not filming here at all, and there are others where I was never even born. This is a huge extrapolation of the uncertainty principle. Deutsch puts each quantum possibility into its own universe, and he's not talking fantasy. He has hard evidence for parallel universes. He finds it in a well-known experiment that's been taught to students of physics for years. 
I first saw this experiment uh, demonstrated when I was an undergraduate. Uh, in fact, it's a very old experiment. It was first done in 1909. This is our light source for the experiment. So the light is being steered by these mirrors onto the slits here. And there's two slits in this slide, and that produces the young slits interference pattern, which we see on the camera. The interference pattern is the set of faint dark stripes at the very centre of the screen. These only appear when two slits are open. One slit, two slits. One slit, two slits. With two slits open, the single beam of light is split into two beams which overlap like ripples on a pond. In some places the ripples reinforce each other and in others they cancel out, so the stripes appear. So what would happen if the intensity of the beam was reduced by a filter until only one photon at a time got to the slits? Now, you can't see the beam at the moment, but if I introduce some liquid nitrogen, we should be able to pick that up. So now you can see the beam scattered by the nitrogen, but you see nothing after the filter. The, the filter essentially stops everything we can see, but the camera can pick up the few photons that are arriving. The photons arrive at the slits one at a time, so those that get through and reach the screen on the other side should make just two bright lines. They shouldn't interfere and produce the full pattern of stripes, but they do. This is how the stripes appear at the computer. When one does the experiment with individual photons, the pattern that builds up um, after one has passed many photons through the apparatus is exactly the same as it was in strong light. And that's something we just don't understand. As an undergraduate, we were told, oh, this is because the photon behaves partly as a particle and partly as a wave. Now, that just doesn't make sense. It's gibberish. Um, it, it's saying that the photon is both in one place and spread out at the same time. Deutsch reckons that the single photons can only produce the stripes if they're interacting with other photons that we simply cannot see.